next presenter, and unfortunately our final presenter, it is uh, Dr. Michael Grosso. He taught philosophy at the City University of New York and New Jersey City University, and is now affiliated with the Division of Personality Studies at the University of Virginia. He is also the review editor for the Journal for the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, and is on the board of directors of the ABPA. His main current interest is combining research into a more comprehensive psychology that includes mediumship, creativity and mysticism, philosophical practice, and counseling. Dr. Gosselin. Now, what I'm going to talk about is mediumship and creativity. Uh, and I want to, to begin in the absence of any of the visual aids that all you guys have, which I'm learning to envy. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of what, my, what I want to say. Uh, and I'll begin with a quotation from Frederick Myers, which sums up in a rather uh, condensed way is the essence of what it is I want to say. Uh, Myers wrote, if we are multiplex beings, let us gain the advantage of our multiplicity. What are we going to get? Because it's simple enough to remember. If we are multiplex beings, let us gain the advantage of our multiplicity. Now, one of the advantages is to learn to access the various aspects of creativity. So what I'm going to do is um, give some concrete examples of how mediumship uh, or something dissociated to states, uh, you can call mediumship, can be put into various aspects of creativity. The second thing I want to do is put all of that in the context of the ideas of Frederick Myers, particularly Myers and Jesus. I and several of my colleagues, several who are here right now, are uh, very interested in reviving the importance of Myers psychology, and I hope this will be at least one illustration of how it might be doing. And secondly, then, the main idea that's, if anything at all, that's quite original in this paper is my emphasis on Myers' uh, theory of creativity, which opens up new domains of creative process, and in particular, there is one particular new domain, and in a sense it's not new, because whenever anyone says something is new, it's usually quite old. But it's new in a sense. Uh, it's in a sense of it's acquiring a conceptual identity, and that is the creativity involved in becoming a human being, involving one's personality, being called the individuation, and, and keeps that goal, where it's called, it keeps called its soul name, in a famous way. So that's the gist of what I want to say, and uh, I realize I'm not going to be able to read this whole page, so I've marked off some of the passages that I will that summarize my ideas on the subject. Now, the first thing I want to do is get to this term of mediumship or medium, and uh, you know, it has the connotation of communicating with the dead, receiving impressions from another world, and from gods and spirits. And I'm going to lay that usage aside. Uh, and the further term for this paper or tonitus. And an action may be automatic or self moves this word automatic means self moves this Greek word. When, as Maya says, of course, it is determined in an organism apart from the general will or control of that organism. In other words, there are centers of activity and mentation in us that are not total, not every day, but there are circumstances in which they took over, and that's the sense of meaning that I want to emphasize. This experiential concern, experiential plasticity, and ego sense, the agility with which the self under special circumstances may reconfigure its identity. Uh, it seems to me that's a psychological fact of great interest, and this is the sense of the word 
and its relationship to the Pacific and the Pacific media. Okay, so uh, I also want to define very quickly how all these different very difficult to define. Bear in mind, for this is Balinese emphasis on how he's teaming. Nevertheless, uh, following Myers, uh, let us say that a performance is created if it produces something extraordinary and original in a particular domain. And if the product is subsequently widely agreed to be useful or to embody in some intrinsic human value, beauty, truth, wisdom, etc. Great names like Shakespeare, Michelangelo, and most of us bring to mind. However, such towering figures can, of course, be rather intimidating. Maya's theory of genius, while fully affirming the value of the giants of culture, expands our understanding of the numerous gradations of the creative process. It is this expansion of the range of creative performance that is best. In particular, there is a sense in which we may speak of self creation or the recreation and transformation of personality that I want to bring to the floor. But let's bring a little ground rules first. And I want to begin with a few words about the medium of art. I'll give a couple of examples of hugely telescopes. Uh, certainly, the American Pearl Time was a Midwestern housewife of modest education and no special interest in language, literature, or poetry. Mrs. Kahn's life was changed at age 31 when an experiment with a Ouija board produced a personality calling itself Tintin's work, a self declared 17th century Englishman. Now, from 1913 to 1937, Earl Cohen produced via Ouija board and speech automatisms 29 volumes of recorded communications from Patience's work, of course. With spice and attitude, Patience poured out plays, novels, poems, witticisms, great art plays, proverbs, a consistent virtuoso literary and linguistic performance. What is especially striking is this new creative personality seems to have sprung suddenly and completely into being from or through the relatively steady, apparently ordinary, Midwestern housewife. Patients produced works in a variety of styles from the 19th century Victorian to the early Anglo Saxon. Uh, the manner in which she produced her third was extraordinary. Rapidly improvised poems on anything suggested. Her demonic feats, this is to say, of course, all of the words of state in the translation that she used automatically right. Her mnemonic feats rivaled those of so called satellites. She could pick up on a composition broken off mid sentence and return to the same word and continue with the same fluency days or weeks later. When challenged to alternate, com to alternate composing, to alternate composing works in different styles, she complied. When Walter Prince asked Patience to dictate a poem to her husband, John Curran, and simultaneously write a letter to a friend to get to pass the test. But now none of this earth's true survival of the dead. Does, however, enlarge our conception of human personality. Given the evidence we have, Schiller in 1928 and more recently Browning in 2003, preferred to describe patients as a secondary personality to a current. Unfortunately, this makes things more difficult for survivors. Uh, if a living person can subliminally acquire the information needed to effectively impersonate uh, somebody, dead or alive, then our confidence in even the best survival cases is significantly weaker. Instead, I suggest we look at the case of patients as a remarkable piece of evidence for a distinct domain of study. And why I come back to several people. Mediumship is service to the creative advance of the human personality. Um, the creative aspect of Pearl's mediumship, I want to call attention to, is not literary, not primarily literary. For herself, I think by the way, I'm not one of those people who think she's a great writer. She's a man who produces this material. Uh, 
the creativity you know, therapeutic and expensive to produce her experimentally creating and all this unconventional stuff. Uh, Wittier, bolder, earthier, wiser, more playful, clearly a tale. They all get that in order to go back to a good more life and spare time. Pearl creates patience. That idea is the real secret of her creativity. And that all of this stuff it becomes a famous literary point. It is worth noting that gradually Pearl starts to become patient. As Prince reminds us in his account, it's becoming this new personality that exemplifies virtually uh, a new species of creative performance. The creative act here seems to consist of Pearl sublimely producing a new point of view. A new center for organizing the consciousness of herself in the world. The new organization allows the new capacities to emerge. When Pearl becomes patient, she's able to marshal the information she needs, sometimes even carrying on with, to synthesize a new personality and convince people of the reality of the story. Well, that's one example, and let me mention now Pauline uh, Smith. I can think of as a medium as a performance artist. Uh, and her career is especially rich in all kinds of creative manifestations. Let me just describe to you how she produced some of her artwork. She wrote this in a statement of life back in 1913. On the day, she said, when I'm out to paint, I am always round, very early, generally between 5 and 6 in the morning, by three loud minutes of my best wishes. That we hear about with meetings. I open my eyes and see my bedroom brightly illuminated, and immediately understand that I have to stand up and work. I dress myself in the beautiful iridescent light and wait a few moments, sitting in my armchair, until the feeling comes that I have to work. It never delays. All at once, I stand up and walk to the picture. When about two steps before, I feel a strange sensation and probably fall asleep at the same moment. I know later on that I must have slept because I noticed that my fingers are covered with different colors. And I do not remember at all who had who used them. By the way, Carlos put up a photograph of one of the paintings. As you may remember, the Martian landscape, I think it's pretty good stuff. I think it's actually quite superb as well. Um, our paintings, as far as I can see, uh, the reproductions without the color are well composed, smoothly executed, fine images that exude a surreal religiosity that compare favorably with the paintings of Peter Kyle. But there is another aspect of Helene's pure creative performance her myth making or myth of poetic capacities. Um, Catherine Miller becomes Helene Smith. Medium, clairvoyant, sensitive, photonicist, table tilted, and all around communicating with other worlds. Helene claims to communicate with modern, learn to speak Martian, and create a written modern uh, Martian language. And these paintings of Martian things, as they were known, and landscapes. Her performances were extremely effective, and the dark hair beauty of the black eyes and trans pioneer in the domain of personality recreation, what she called soul making in Europe. Now, let's give another example of more contemporary Mexican men. And uh, they always based on one book I read by them called The Lake. And I've been trying to track down where Mexican men is today. And I don't think it's a point that if anyone knows anything about them, I'd like to hear about Well, wait, okay, let me get through with the rest. Uh, I just want to get this out. Okay. Uh, the difference is, but I want to point out that man is, is different because he's more critical and constantly experimental in his approach. He combines active intelligence with creative talent in the arts and polish the characters with psychic evolution. Several points bear on the problem of creativity. For one, he seems to have succeeded in redirecting and disturbing psychic forces into automatic weapons, which may be helpful. So, he had a school where he was writing you know, an essay in school, and he suddenly felt something seized his hand. He later wrote, 
If it looked as though the disturbances were imminent, they were the public. I would sit down and write later if it came clear to me that the writing was the controlling factor. It appears that the energy I used for writing was previously the way it was supposed to be. Manning developed collectively the sensitivity to auras and all kinds of other sensitivities. We start going all over the place. But this is the only thing I like about him that puts him in a special category. Sometimes a notable spirit like that of Bertrand Russell brought in and delivered a message. Which Manning did not take his face back. Now, we're here again, this critical self awareness why he is at the same time pouring all this stuff out from his life. You know, so, Manning produced hundreds of automatic writers of thinking, claiming to emanate from numerous well known artists, such as Dura, Boyer, and Fanning. I have to say that what I've seen in his work is very impressive stuff. Uh, but it seems unlikely that these drawings, done in styles of the original artists, were indeed the products of the spirits of these artists. In any case, we are more concerned with Manning's creative influence. It is though Manning, in his, in this stage of his psychic evolution, went from being a cultivated stage to kind of a low grade activity, in so some ways, to kind of open mind to the spirits of great artists who express themselves in the present. The story of Matthew Manning illustrates the growth potential of meaning in the creative process. Manning, moreover, unlike Helene Smith, is more prone to combine creative mediumship with critical intelligence. The critical attitude for his own psychic path, according to his own narrative, we're not composing this idea, we're not spirit to speed up the creative process. Okay. Uh, I want now to give a couple of examples of what I call creative cooperation or joint meetings. I think this is a very interesting these examples provide wonderful illustrations of how we all might think about the relationships in general. I won't say more than that, I'll just give you the point. I'm thinking here in 1923, after Charles Smith, and I'm going to miss the beat, like the point of the relationship. Joyce produced a 20, 25 scripts by means of automatic writing that claimed to have emanated from the mind of the deceased Oscar Wilde. Neither had any particular prior interest in Wilde, which produces many of the most of the new and more automatic writing. The writing style of the scripts was clearly suggested as Wilde's quite a lot of writing in starting to turn his phrase. The script itself is only a very wild handwriting. It can contain references to wild life that were practically unknown to the autonomous. This interesting material, according to Ellen's picture, falls short of supporting the survival of life, but more to our purpose, supports the idea that mediumistic or dissociated states of knowledge sometimes seem to influence previous things. In this case, moreover, the creativity seems to depend on a kind of uh, autocracy. Uh, the These by themselves were completely unsuccessful in the way of the right of the and was not until Hector rested his hand lightly in these hands that the script came. It is not clear what was the guy in the intelligence, but in fact, if there was one intelligence responsible for producing the script, the best thing was the partnership or convergent dynamic of these detectors and hence the Mr. B was not aware of having seen Wilde's handwriting prior to his own writing performance. But the possibility came to be ruled out that he did. Uh, and so on. I'm going to leave uh, that material out. The main point is that that is simply an example, and I'll have a few more of these shortly, of how uh, two people separately were not able to do something that in some subtle, psychic, jointly mediumistic fashion. They were able to do something that was astonishing and impressive. Um, now, I want to briefly say something about uh, the way one might characterize the survival aspect of music as, as an art. Uh, under the heading of impersonating the dead. Consider the most extraordinary and perplexing form of mediumistic creativity by fine actors who convincingly impersonate fictional characters. Third mediums like Eleanor and Piper or Gladys Osborne and Lennon have been able to convince their audience that they have truly impersonated 
what kinds of the personalities known to these people? In order to accomplish this thought of the test, they apparently draw on the full resources of this little man, practically scanning the environment for the information needed to recreate the image of the deceased personality. Good meaning can reproduce voice, tone, manner, happiness, and text phrase, and other personal traits of the deceased person. So the audience, in this context, considers the fans, are duly amazed, sometimes intellectually compelled, and often deeply moved. And that's a good point. Both interpretations, you know, whether or not there is someone surviving that they're picking up, or whether or not it's true fiction, true facts too. Uh, to me, strong evidence for how medium is creativity. Um, suppose the medium has in fact succeeded in being possessed by an identifiable external personality. This is kind of how to create a fact. It involves the synthesis of many skills that have been found in order. In part, what is created in the audience is a sense of rational or emotional conviction that so and so has indeed suggested. Or suppose the medium has only created a convincing facsimile, a compelling illusion of the deceased person. This seems to be no less than the creative experience. So, let me give some examples now. What we, we're talking about mediums and what they can do in, in a way that is we can characterize as creative. Let's talk about a few examples of great artists who have mediumistic characteristics. For example, the idea of the muse deeply embedded in the oldest mythology of the Greeks. Here, I'm going to read something from Hesiod, the island of the gods. We read, One day, they taught Hesiod glorious song while he was shepherding his land on the top of Then the muse began by declaring, speaking to Hesiod, Miserable, wretched, mere bellies, we know how to speak with the possessing of human race, including the possessing of the present. We know how to speak many false things as though they were true. But we know when we will to other people. And, quote, and then they, quote, breathe into me a divine voice. The last phrase literally illustrates the idea of this phrase. <coughs> Being breathed into the next turn of the state. The music, Jonathan, by the way, not in the the God of Memory, symbolizes this experience first. Now, the text poet makes two things clear. First, there is a psychic discontinuity between the poet and the source of inspiration. In terms of Maya psychology, as we will see, there is a discontinuity between super liminal and subliminal inspiration of mental life. Also, Hesiod divined the fact that minds would later confirm that the human mind would be both evolutive and disillusioned as a source of genius or rush. This recognition of genius is resulting from something outside of personal mental life that's particularly popular with romantic poets. For example, John Keats, in one of his letters, tossed off this insight into the psychology of creativity. Once it struck me, he said, what quality went to form a man that he was especially little for and was pushed to it to get so he wanted. I mean, negative capability. That is, when man is capable of being in uncertainty, mystery, doubt, without any irritable reason or distracting reason. In short, it's an ability to absent oneself from the compulsions of what Myers calls the superliminal mind. That calls us that it is to reduce things to their factual and rational character. So the poet with negative capability is open to all the possibilities and has the ability to tolerate and even prefer uncertainty, ambiguity, mystery, and doubt, which well describes the character of the subliminal world. The sub-making region of ideas, dreams, and visions. There are other great poets who gave us special secrets uh, in their letter. The Boy Wonder, his poet, Arthur Rambo. I'm not talking about Stellan. Uh, 
left us a letter with his theory of creative association. Rambo describes his method for becoming a spirit in the same way, and it is based on, he uses the word, that edge of the mind, a deregulation or a deruling uh, of, or derailing or disordering of all the spatial values. Uh, in the process, one dismantles the ordinary conscious people. And the whole office of the planet formula. Dirt is an I and somebody else. And that. Rambeau found his way to the new center of his poetic being, and his method essentially was to disrupt the workings of his secret liminal mind. Now, the language between creativity and mediumship, uh, so, of course, that mind is. Jump to William Blake. Instead of the visionary, mediumistic, revolutionary, and decidedly extroverted uh, mystic, uh, William Blake, who wrote, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man. I will not reason and compare my differences to create. He was given for Blake with an expression of his spiritual freedom that meant responding to the dictates of inspiration. Blake wrote his friend Buck. That his prophetic poem Milton was written here, quote, Blake. From immediate dictation, 12 or sometimes 20 or 30 lines at a time, without key meditation, and even against my will, and later at it, and I praise it, since again I pretend to be the author of the second the authors of an eternity. Now, according to the famous Blake's book by the name of Blake, quote, struggled his whole life through to join the conscious and the subconscious. This, of course, is exactly what Maya is interested to be in as a genius. Blake is conscious of himself as binding to the dictates of the subliminal universe. As one he wrote, I am under the direction of messengers in heaven, daily, nightly. And that's a good thing. Why can't you but if we fear he goes on to say, to do the dictates of our angels, uh, we will suffer, quote, dismal torments and be stunned as a trait of the eternity. Eternity for Blake is the afterworld, the world of imagination. Blake's refusal to bury the past has implicated in some society. We do not care for our souls when we bury our past, when we pay the emotional cost, when we fail to treat our own soul's system. Inspiration, not acting after the time, is the sin of the Holy Ghost. As he put it, one of the problems of hell. You know, Marilyn Nixon, a nurse, unacted to God. And that's not going to be taken with it. Our next example of mediumizing genius is William Butler Yeats, who greatly admired William Boyd. And in a vision, Yeats declared that his recent poetry was a visionary. Uh, recent poetry has gained in self possession and power. Then he adds, I owe this case to an incredible experience. The incredible experience was on October 4th, 1917, his wife surprised him by attempting automatic writing. So I found an exciting utterance to the report, and an unknown writer or writer said, We have come to give you metaphors for poetry. Thus commenced an extraordinary process of creativity that Yeats pursued with his wife for three years. Then he writes, Exposition in sleep came to an end. In 1920, I began an exhaustive study of some of the 50 copybooks of automatic scripts. These copybooks were the water not the back room. These copybooks were the raw material which produced, from which produced some of the greatest poetry poetry and prose in the 20th century. Today, back in this domain of heart history. Recall the case of Venus and Hester in the production of the Alphabet. It was a joint effort. When Hester rested her hand on Venus, the brilliant literary persona of the Alphabet was not known. No genealogy was gave to his wife. Although his wife did most of the writing, that was just the automatic thing. But they were still doing it together. Uh, the, and the performance basically resulted from a partnership and dissociation, or both of them dissociated, a species of joint meeting. 
Now, the last example in this section I want to give you uh, is one of the great 20th century American poets, one which you may not know as well, James. James Merrill, and in particular his big masterpiece, The Changing Light of Sandals, in 1993, also produced jointly through a leaf board by himself and his longtime friend R. Uh, this is where they thought. Now, I'm just going to quote this uh, an argument from authority, but it really could be, but this could give you some impression. Harold Boone, our greatest literary critic, says, I don't know that the book that after him, at least after some dozen readings, can be overpraised. There's nothing since the greatest writers of our century equals it in dynamic force. Now, in the opening pages of that book, Merrill describes the instant the Ouija board comes to life, the full cover of the Ouija board, is a poetic rendition. Y-E-S, yes, a new and urgent power, yes, he's the cup, it's word, fun, hesitated, dark at all, a devil is gone in evil, gyroscope out fingers, road, horseback. But it's the only but something dead, the instant one was in other words, as soon as someone took the hand away, stop the right. So it's amazing. So after being a pastor and you to his autonomous wife, you find a creative thought. Uh, now, when it worked, when they were working together, the results were fine. And here's three lines, which I think are very familiar. Uh, yet even the most fragmentary message that came through when we were both in two. Twice as entertaining, twice as wise as either of his mediums and followers. I find this completely fascinating that the idea that two people in a joint relationship can produce something altogether that transcends their individual needs as creative individuals. By establishing that core between individuals, it may be possible to draw on creative sources of intelligence. Otherwise, inaccessible. Uh, and sometimes very high order creative performance. Now, let me say some words about Meyer's theory of genius. Um, genius occupies a high place in Meyer's view of human personality, and for him, constitutes the, the true normality uh, of the species. The basic intuition is that genius is what happens when the superliminal and subliminal straight of our mental life increase things that unite, interact, and enrich each other. Genius, according to Meyer, is that the cooperation of the signals in the emergent set. And personal genius reports the fact that the successful cooperation of an unusually large number of elements of his personality. And then finally, genius requires coordinating the waking and sleeping phases of one's existence. So genius is not just about inspiration. Enlarged receptivity to the submerged self is enough. My thoughts about the world of volition, the new elements made available by inspiration must be great and integrated. The differentiator of genius in both lies in an increased control of the subliminal mentality. Producing works of genius requires patient, deliberate, and steadfast attentiveness to short a well done will. So genius is a paradoxical state of affairs that combines subliminal upright with increased control over the subliminal. That's very, very much the reason. Now, I want to get to one quote here of Meyer that is key to my main thesis is that Meyer enables us to enlarge the domain of possible creativity. He says, genius may be recognized in every region of thought and emotion, in each direction of man's everyday self may be more or less permeable to subliminal impulse. So, every moment of mental life, these superficial characters more or less adapted to the demands of the mundane environment, also possesses a subliminal depth that is normally hidden from us. You start with my exposed subliminal uprush is possible any moment in any mode of experience, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual. There are opportunities for the synthetic work of genius to play everywhere in every context, situation, and form of consciousness. That to me is the most interesting feature 
Now, I want to mention a few um, examples of 20th century uh, advanced Myers, a Myers based type of theory of And uh, first, I just mentioned something about the surrealist. Now, in Breton, I'm very good, 1933, wrote an article, an article that uh, acknowledges Myers. And he uh, says, the realism has above all work to bring inspiration back into favor. And we have for that purpose promoted the use of ordinary forms of The surrealist aim is nothing less than to unify the personality. What that means for the term is exactly what Myers meant by genius the coordination and interpenetration of dreams and waking life. This is how the put it in the 1924. Manifesto of surrealism. I believe in the future revolution, revolution of these two states, being the reality, which are seemingly so contradictory, into a kind of absolute reality, a very reality, if one may so speak. So then again, you see, surrealism is based on the assumption that it is possible to forge new psychophysical realities by, what does that mean? What? Okay. <laughs> your here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, when, when they I'll just skip all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no end of time and stuff. I want to just quote a few lines, a uh, line or two from the last part of the three of the movies that you're making. Uh, here, I'm going to quote a line from Adam Cross, which summarizes a good deal of what I want to say. This is more on this couple of years. Let's get here. Here's this wonderful thing from Adam who is with us. I'm going to read the paragraph and it goes over here. You can see me. The psychological situation was artificially induced that all the opportunities are referring to a famous case of a medium who acquired new creative dimensions of his personality. For the reintegration, healing, and even enlargement of personality. Early investigators, such as John A. and Binary, gradually came to understand the therapeutic potential of their subjects, multiple sects, as that as have others more recently. In a stunning sense, a book on this subject, I am trained to be read. It is my opinion that it could conceivably be therapeutically beneficial to assist the creation of a full blown personality that embodies mixed elements already existing within the individual in this organized way. You'll have to read the whole paper in detail to get how that can help you. But I hope you got this. Thank you. And it's really what we've been talking about all the time. And by looking at what derangement of the senses, some kind of unusual state, it was cathartic mania, which would be the feeling that we have been talking about it, prophetic mania, which would have to do with anomalous experiences, poetic mania, which was not doing poetry, but it was creating in general. And I think the first one was erotic mania, just being able to. Come beyond yourself, I think, with somebody. You know, with some larger. It's right there. Right right okay. Right. Right. It's undoubtedly deep in the tradition, these insights. And remember that Maya is a part of the self. So, I mean, much of his inspiration derives from the past. And to make us a very provocative presentation, as always. Um, and I just want to return briefly to your discussion of Pearl Cohen, um, because she's, she's a, it's a fascinating case. Um, and as I recall, she, when she began to do this automatic writing, she would do it with pencil and paper. And later, she started to get so much material that just to keep up with it, she switched to using a typewriter. And later, as the years went by, she did this for over 20 years. 
And as time went by, you know, it just became so normal for her to be taking this dictation from another dimension or wherever it came from. You know, she would do it while she was smoking a cigarette, drinking tea, eating, having conversations with people. And in this context, I wonder whether trance is even an appropriate word to use, you know? Maybe we need to come up with another word to designate this kind of a state of consciousness. Well, you know, some of the old writers talk about co-consciousness, too. You know, there's a different streams of consciousness operating simultaneously. There's a lot of other points in the world. So that's possible, too. I found this notion of double dissociation interesting, very interesting. Uh, and one, I think that's much easier time thinking about it in individual terms. And one begins to wonder sort of if there are metaphysical implications of this. But especially then when you bring in Meyer's notion of volition, then I, my sort of potential understanding begins to break apart because I, I tend to think of volition as sort of individuated. But if they're working together in some sort of collaboration, how might volition work? Well, I mean, stuff comes up, I mean, I uh, in my stepping in the first years of life, I frequently encounter things that just pop into my mind, the impulses that do the drawing, the phrases that fly into my head. Uh, and it's there. That I even contribute consciously to that production. But then I think, and the, 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 the critical mind kicks in, so do I really need this phrase, or do you express it? And I think that I'm more of the work. And I think that's what my really has captured from my understanding uh, the essence of the creative process. There, there is a coincidence of opposites here, a kind of identity and difference between two opposing tendencies. One is this uprushing, spontaneous, you know, lava, like volcanic lava erupting to the surface. And then uh, someone has done the, the artist or the thinker that will have to give shape to it. That seems to be inevitable. Uh, although, I mean, much of the time the speaking is done with me. But the ultimate judge of its value as a creative product that can be useful to people at large uh, is the application of the conscious critical uh, mind to taste the volition and will and all the shaping aspects that are not. On the time, I think that you see, even when you study, which I left out completely, the art of the insane, there's a huge uh, literature on the growing art of Growing literature and all of these things, uh, they, they pour their stuff out, but they seem to take over consciously. Part of them takes in the volitional controlling element. Now, if they don't, if that volitional element is not the case, then they just melt. <laughs> then they're just gushing out the uh, rubbish. So there's got to be that combination of the, uh, of the two aspects of the struggle and the does that make any sense? Yeah. So it would be inappropriate to ask if you were insane when you wrote the paper there. It's hard work to get there. Okay, Dr. Patrick. Well, I don't know how I can improve on my own quote, but something. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael, for this. It's very interesting paper. I, I uh, I think I understand you right to think of when you say mediumship or creativity, you're talking about the fact that the medium has been between two worlds, the world of this known physical esteem world and the unseen world, but I mean, that is what you're saying. It's neutral with regard to whether spirits are involved or not. That's neutral. It could be, yes, but no. Yeah. Well, that's what you mean by mediumship. It's a broad right. Right. That in other words, what? Right. Um, it puts me in mind of the fact that uh, at the beginning of a whole development that we still profit from tremendously today, and that is the discovery of mesmerism and particularly magnetic sleep, which became hypnosis. There's a really interesting example of this, a priest of who developed 
this in the first place. He had this young man that he magnetized, and when he went into this altered state of consciousness, uh, he could read particularly his mind and so forth. He, had, he was able to do various things. Among other things, uh, he seemed to create a new personality. I'm thinking the personality creation here that you talked about. The example I used, but I didn't have time to read it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, I think that I don't dwell on that the example, except that he did. He was a totally different person. He said, who is it? The he owned the estate, the estate where this young man lived. So he's like a person I don't know. He's like my equal. He talks to me like I to anybody. This is an impossible thing at the time. Um, there are those who say that with the development of access to this other uh, personality or this other side of ourselves, that occurred in that time, 1784, that this is the acceptance of the fact that we have within us unlimited potential to be used. That it was an opening up the possibility to basically believe that anybody could heal themselves, find a the, the, uh, way to heal themselves, find out what was wrong with other people, and so forth. So this was opening up the notion of the soul, mm -hmm. um, which then developed into spiritualism, modern psychotherapy, the whole business came out of this feeling of unlimited potential in the individual. And I thought that this was a tremendous sort of confirmation mm -hmm. of the kind of thing you're talking about leading to the next direction of it. Am I understanding that? That's really a real interesting question. I mean, I've learned a great deal from you, Adam. That's why we're here for it. Okay, Rosemary Gaiman. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, I was very interested in the partnership between the male and the female in this cooperative mediumship, which strikes me as very alchemical in nature because in spiritual alchemy, the artifacts of the alchemist, the man works with a woman, the Sora Mystica, to create an enlightened state of consciousness that hopefully will lead to the Philosopher's Stone. So I'm wondering if there's more to explore here in this idea of cooperative mediumship to produce uh, an enlightened, expanded state of consciousness to produce something enlightened. That we might be looking, maybe we should look more into that. Uh, working in pairs rather than just with individuals. Right. On the other hand, I, I wouldn't want to confirm myself with the use of the somewhat esoteric uh, alchemical terminology and symbolism. I have to prefer to reduce things to plain terms that we can understand on a human level. I just think that there are people we know from experience we click with. And there's nothing, there's, you know, there's a difference between all levels of society. And I'm conscious of the fact that that, that clicking experience, that sense of uh, shared sensibility that may be produced in certain kinds of relationships may contain the secrets to unusual capacities of self development. That seems seems like a worthy idea to explore in its own way. It can be applied not only into the realm of romantic relationships, but all types of relationships which have their effect, uh, optimal, alchemical formula, as it were, to properly find it. Well, my question concerns Yates. I was wondering if, you know, if he used any of the um, the rituals from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn for expanding consciousness and producing this. Oh, yes, correct. But he was just deeply into symbolism, mm -hmm. the means of provoking what he called the great memory. And uh, he, he put himself into trances, and being a poet of considerably great depth, uh, that was his gift to, to gain access, to have access to that. But he also had a wife that uh, was completely sympathetic. Okay, um, I just want to say, in our, in our more recent history, there's lots of artists that. Uh, you talked about the insane. There's a lot of artists that give us examples of their creativity that uh, were schizophrenic or suffered from that depressive. That's like, uh, like Van Gogh and you know, Hemingway. There's a lot of actors and actresses. Yeah. Uh, 
there's a very good book uh, by Kate Davidson, which is about bipolarism, who is one of the you know, amazing numbers of artists who poets and musicians who were suffering from uh, you know, depression and all the genius. And the whole relationship between that is going to be a different topic. Let's see. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, sir? Yes, I don't know. You're the professional. I'm a videographer in New York, that's why. That was an interesting take, Michael, on uh, Myers' work. Uh, also, I know that Dr. Carlos Alvarado has written about Myers, and you have spoke about Myers being a classical scholar, but can you also tell about his background, which was reviewed in Carlos' article about um, how he was not really classically trained and didn't hold a higher degree as far as I understand. And I think this also brings up the question about institutions and the potential of institutions to be more inclusive. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure that would be like not being classically Well, I, I believe that he... No, no, at that level, but he didn't hold higher degrees, is that correct? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, the memory was... And he was largely uh, marginal as far as that time period amongst his peers. Well, in many ways, he was clearly a distinctly marginal personality, but I mean, he was largely uh, recognized for his uh, achievements in the public. I think maybe what he's referring is that you know, he didn't have medical training or, or training as a, a psychologist, but at that time he was not perhaps not a psychologist, but now, but you know, still, he was much, he was a brilliant guy and, and much more qualified than almost anyone else in, in his lifetime to, to analyze psychology at a very different level. So I think the point he's making is that he, he didn't have that training and that affected him later. It was been accepted, you know, like some of the critics will say, oh, this guy's just, just a classic astrologer, or he's just you know, a guy from the humanities, and the positions at the time, you know, had their statutes. Well, I think it just clearly kind of reinforces what you were saying, is that he superseded the expectations and, and obviously transcended at a certain level just through the very dynamics of what you've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Kelly, would you like to? Well, well, I really don't have much to add to that, except for the fact that I think you have to keep in mind that at that time, in the 19th century, there was no remove the sort of specialization and training and fragmentation of things that there is now. So in that sense, he was put in with a lot of people who were not in touch with it, if you want to say it. I mean, they're doing lots of things that weren't so fragmented into these sort of professional compartments that we have now, by any means. Hi there. My name is Lisa Coley, and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I want to welcome you to the Foundation's YouTube channel. There's already a wealth of information available posted, and we have plans to continue to post our classic lectures and new materials. So you don't want to miss out, so hit that bell, please subscribe, and you'll be notified. And hope you enjoy.